Welcome back. I'm glad you've not all left. I'm, I'm sure that... I hope that you will leave after Gary and Ruth uh, have spoken. So, now's the time we've been waiting for. We're going to listen how we can exit the crisis. Ruth is going to speak to us. Um, she's uh, come here from Auckland in New Zealand. And so is Gary from Washington in the US, who is also going to talk to us about co countries in Africa and Latin America and in Europe. Yes, uh, we would be interested in listening from um, uh, listening from Mrs. Richardson, having listened to Mr. Karkatsoulis's uh, presentation, if she thinks that this can be applied in Greece, if she thinks that the two cases are similar based on the Greek reality, we will be very interested to hear what you have to say. Thank you for coming back for uh, round two, as it were. There were a few knockout punches in round one. My friend here, he wants to knock the spaghetti. Very, very good start. But first of all, a very big thank you to Eleanor. You know, it's not easy to convene a forum like this. I mean, isn't this a wonderful example itself of creative destruction? This old building that many of you knew as, as, a, as a gas works, and here we have got gas of a different kind. We've got different talk, very important talk, in this forum. And this very lively, high-tech, where you are plugged in in various ways, has got two themes. So we have thought and action. Now, if you'd listen to the previous panelists, you have to be convinced about the case for change. That's not why I'm here. I'm here because I represent the action part of this slogan. I'm here to convince you Greeks that now is the very best time to take action on a program of reform. The faster the action you take, the faster you can start to reap the benefits of your fundamental reforms. I'm here because I've lived through a fundamental reform experience. Many of the similar characteristics that you have now here in Greece, we had to face in New Zealand. And the essence of my message to you is that the prize is worth winning. So here I am in Athens. And for people of my geography, when we think of Athens, we think of the Olympic Games. I'm really here because of the economic race that New Zealand has won. And just let me tell you about two of the three medals that New Zealand has won as a result of those reforms. Number one, we are the easiest place in the world in which to do business. Secondly, we have just won the prize for the transparency and integrity of our budget arrangements. And number three, we are typically a country that either gets gold, silver, or bronze in terms of being one of the freest nations in the world. Now, why does it matter? It doesn't matter just to get the prize. It matters because that prize has made very significant and positive change in my country. Why would you want to be number one at doing business in the world? Because you want the world to do business with you. You want the people in your country to know they don't have to go offshore to commercialize their talents, to play out their business dreams, to work with their fellow countrymen and women. That's why it's important to be the first in the world in which to do business. And secondly, why is it important to get a, 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 an open, transparent budget of integrity? You know the grief that Greece now faces because you had none of those things 
in your budget. And I'm ashamed to say, but I should say in an open forum, I gave a speech to many ministers of finance and their advisors in the middle of last year in which I talked about the perils of Greek accounting. Sorry, Greece, but it's true. You want to have that budget prize because then you avoid the kind of chaos that you are facing right now. And why would you want a prize for freedom? If we know anything about modern society, let alone modern economies, it's that free and innovative people are the key to progress in those societies. Whether it be in deepest, darkest Africa, China, where I too work a lot now, uh, the old Eastern Europe, what we know is that there is a direct relationship between the degree of freedom people enjoy economically, politically, socially and personally, and the prosperity of the nation in which they live. So all of those prizes are important because they are the stuff of which your progress, your transformation is made. Now, we didn't get those prizes by accident. I, I heard you ask your Nobel laureate, Please, can it be without trauma? Do we have to face the pain of a recession? I translate that by saying, there are many in this country, and not just here, but many who say, I want to go to heaven, I want full employment, I don't want the IMF on my back, I want opportunities for my kids, I don't want to see them go offshore, I want to retire at a, at a decent level of income. I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to die. Well, sorry, Greece. Quite a lot has got to die about the way you've done business. Don't take it from me. Take it from my friend who's working at that coalface every day. The bottom line of what I'm going to tell you about the reform story of New Zealand is that the prize is worth the winning, number one. It's a pity that my politician friend has now gone. She called for many people to be the voice of reform. That's true. But the hero of a story of real reform is not so much an individual as an idea. And the idea that drove the New Zealand reforms, which now drives economic success in so many other countries, is the idea of openness, of freedom to trade ideas, goods and services, of a competitiveness that comes when you face the market, not face the government. Yes, the government has very special and crucial roles, I'm a lawyer, not an economist. And one of the crucial roles of the state is not just to ensure the rule of law, but to ensure property rights. And it is, in my view, absolutely critical that the state uses the force of its authority to develop property rights of integrity. But there are many things that the state does and does badly and nations have been penalised when the talented people have been taught, inculcated, it's in their DNA, to face the state for all of the remedies, rather than face the market with ideas and goods and services that the market would want to buy and pay well for. So that's the hero of our transformation. So this is a forum that invites us, and we only honour Eleanor and her colleagues if we seriously address this question. It invites us to ask this question, imagine. Imagine if we could transform Greece into a modern, vibrant economy 
that's noticed for all the right reasons, that becomes famous because it's an economic powerhouse. And you can only become that economic powerhouse if you take matters into your own hands. No amount of pushing from the outside, waving the big stick, is going to convince you more than you should convince yourselves that you have it in your own hands to become that economic powerhouse. So I'm here today to help fire up that imagination. I'm not going to give you so much diagnosis as solutions. I talk to you not as a theoretician, not as an academic, but somebody who had to live through and lead these reforms. So I speak with scars on my back, and I speak of an experience where the voting public kept voting for governments prepared to embrace the new reformed reality. So what's it going to take to make reform of a fundamental kind happen? To, to my mind, pretty much three things. It requires enough people, they don't have to be many, but it requires enough people who are brave enough to step out. Many of you are here today. You've made it your business on a Monday to come and spend a whole day in getting your heads around what real reform might look like. To me, that shows you know, a certain amount of, of bravery because it's much easier just to blame the INF or the bankers or you know, God knows what else. Somebody else did it to us. So first of all, you've got to have enough people who are in positions of, of influence of public opinion who are brave enough to step out. You have to be able to team up with others of courage and conviction. I could never have survived as a reforming minister of finance if I did not have at my side, centre, back, front, if I did not have like-minded voices in the private sector. No politician by themselves can generate the kind of constituency for the reform. There have to be many voices who consistently argue for the same kind of transformation. And together, with the bravery to step out, forming a team of believers, then it's a matter of figuring out how to make it happen and how quickly. Now, as it happens, I'm a now person. I like things done now. So when we decided, for example, faced with the same spaghetti junction, <coughs> perhaps if we could get the next slide up, perfect, all of it, yeah. Faced with that spaghetti junction in the state sector alone, and I'll come to that because state reform is one of the big six, we said two years. That's it, finite time. We only have a three-year term of office, so you've got to be pretty fast. In two years, we said we will go away from all of that old Greek accounting and all of the public accounts will be just like the private sector accounts. So, for example... Uh, in my briefcase, just, just as I left New Zealand, here every month published you know, the financial statements of the government of New Zealand, open, with integrity, uh, you know, honest, uh, and, and in great shape. Okay? In two years, we said that must happen. And equally, in our public sector, where I think you said 13 or so ways in which you could get a job, we said within two years, the idea of a job for life goes. The idea that you have no contract for performance, we're not going to have that. In two years, we said we will have a form of performance management, proper modern contracting. We will recruit people on the merits. We make it clear what it is we expect of them and we hold them accountable for that performance. We happened also to halve the size of the public sector in the process. As a minister, I had a contract 
with the head of the Ministry of Finance, my chief executive, I made it very clear what I was buying, what it cost, and I had to account to my Prime Minister for the outcomes that I sought from spending that money. That is a radically different way of thinking about public sector administration. Two years, right. So th th this is, uh, the, 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 if you like, the now people. Because it's no use trying to shake the dice inside the existing system, which I suspect is happening here in Greece. A lot of that structural, institutional environment still stays, and there's a lot of you know, shaking of heads and shaking of the dice, hoping that you'll come up with a different result. You will not. This is a systemic structural problem, and it calls for structural solutions. So this is a time for entrepreneurship of every kind. Political entrepreneurship, a very different kind of politics is called for. The nature of the conversation with the public has to change, which is why this was so refreshing and why I was willing to fly the world to do this, because this is an interactive forum. I'm not standing in the parliament who go, yeah, yeah, we've heard all that before. I'm standing with you. You are as much the political entrepreneurs as those in the parliament. It calls for political entrepreneurship. If you want jobs, it calls for much more business entrepreneurship in this country, where you win your place in the market, not because you've got friends in the government, not because somebody is going to give you a preference or a privilege, but because you offer the best value for money service to a market customer who's going to pay you for that. Again, that's a very different kind of perception. We live, as, as I said earlier, uh, in an age of disruptive innovation. I'm a huge fan of the innovation. I understand how traumatic it can be if the status quo is disrupted. But if the status quo is bankrupt, why stick with it? You know, I use my BlackBerry, but I might equally use Nokia. Nokia used to be the best thing that the Finns could talk about. It was the big deal. And they started to believe that they didn't need to innovate anymore. They were a company. And that company is on the brink of going bust. That's what their new chief executive told them. It's the new chief executive came to Nokia and said, we are standing on a burning platform. And unless we change, we're going to go out of business. Well, can countries go out of business? Effectively, they can. And what makes you think that only companies face that kind of pressure, that kind of innovative disruption? Companies face that, but countries do as well. And countries that are alive to that and get ahead of the curve by reforming are the countries that are going to do extremely well. The difficulty is that while the private sector, and these days mostly I'm on the boards of public companies and we're selling goods and services from way down in New Zealand to the rest of the world, and we've got to innovate very, very fast. The private sector does find it easier to do this. The difficulty with the public sector is it's so trapped in that labyrinth, it's so trapped in that spaghetti junction, that despite fantastic people who operate inside the system, they don't have the ability to transform it, which is why the rules of the game have got to change. You know, I come from a country only half the size of Greece. Uh, we're a small island economy. We're a trading country. We share some similarities. But you don't just have to look for the pattern of reform to a nation like New Zealand that had to reform to save its life. Just have a look to the north of you. Look at the Nordic countries. How many of you read the British Economist magazine? Okay, so I get it on my iPad. I'm so in love with that technology. So I left New Zealand on Friday afternoon. 
It's there on my iPad. I can read all The Economist as I fly over. And on the cover of this week's Economist is a photo of a Nordic-looking fellow saying, Nordic countries, the new supermodel. <coughs> so you look at Sweden. When I grew up, Sweden was seen as the socialist paradise. Sweden understood facing the same kind of pressures that Greece does now, that we did in New Zealand two or three decades ago. Sweden, in fact, has been systematically through, it started off by a government, if you like, of the, the more conservative kind, but the reform has persisted. S Sweden has now some of the most uh, flexible labour markets, some of the, the most innovative systems inside the public sector. So with schools, for example, in Sweden, instead of funding the producer, the school, and then the pupils turn up and whether you get good, bad, or indifferent, too bad, so the good, the bad, and the ugly survive, in Sweden they fund the pupil, and the pupil then has the purchasing power to choose a school that's going to deliver to them transforming the delivery of education. And they've not just done it in schooling. They've done it in a whole range of public services. So if you look at Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, those Nordic countries have in fact said, we know what works. This is not an ideological conviction they've had. They've looked at the poor performance and the wasteful activity in the state, and they have moved more of the market into the state. Works for citizens, it works for the economy, and they don't have the IMF carrying the big stick. Go to China, very different political system to the one that you and I enjoy. You know, New Zealand always, when we think of Greece, we think of demos, of democracy. In fact, it was Athens and the city-state here that democracy began its life. And New Zealand was the first country in the world to give women the vote. And for my money, I don't think you're real democracy unless all of us can participate. But if you have a look at China, that still in many senses is a closed political system, one in 12 young people who graduate from university in China get to belong to the Communist Party. They're not so much joining an ideology as joining a club. And if you're lucky enough to be one of the 12 who joins the club, you're on a fast track. But if you happen to be the unlucky other 11, all the time you're left behind. You don't get to play. You don't get the privileges. You don't get the breaks. How can a society develop to the next level with a system like that? But for all of that, the critical turning point in modern China was a little fellow, probably as short as I am, called Deng. And he went down to the southern part of China and he said, I want, yeah, I want capitalism. It can have socialist characteristics, but I want capitalism. That one powerful signal has meant hundreds of millions of people in China in the last 10, 20 years have come out of poverty just because he unleashed a market mechanism. Think what China could really do if they had genuine political freedoms to match now their economic freedoms. Or think of India. I became the finance minister in New Zealand in 1990. My counterpart in India is now the prime minister. And at about the same time that we were doing our brave little reforms in the South Pacific, Mr. Singh had a much, much bigger job. I mean, to reform 4 million people is one thing. To reform, you know, 1.2 billion people is, is, is another matter entirely, in a democracy, in a chaotic one of that. But for all that, that Minister of Finance, now their Prime Minister, he undertook some fundamental market reforms in India that is now their motor. And we know the two countries really to look out for as the big new beasts on, on the economic block. They are China and they are India. The bottom line of all of this is public policy does matter. It matters a lot. I want to talk 
today, especially about both policy and politics of reform. But the most important lesson I want to leave with you is public policy matters a lot. New Zealand was afflicted by much of the same phenomena, if you like, that you find here in Greece. A, a political class that had been unwilling during all of the good years to make reforms. I mean, why make reforms in good years? You know, we all know that ends in tears because you're made to make reforms in a crisis. New Zealand was heavily indebted. We think we thought the world owed us a standard of living. We weren't earning it. You Greeks weren't buying enough New Zealand lamb. And by the way, you went in with the European Union, so you kicked us out anyway. So we thought we were owed that standard of living, and as it dived, we said, we'll just borrow to make up the difference. Well, there comes a time, and it did, as New Zealand faced the crisis in the mid-1980s, when your lenders will no longer tolerate that kind of behaviour. Uh, we know that when you allow a private sector to exist in the gift of the government, where just a few firms get all of the riches because they are protected and preferred by the government, you know that's not right. And you know it's going to end in tears. Because if you're protected, you become lazy, you become inefficient, you stop facing your market, and you keep facing the government. And so you've got this complicit relationship, and it's very corrosive, let alone corrupt, between the private sector and, and the government and the public sector. We had to break that umbilical cord, which was very strong between the two sectors. So we had all of those behaviours, high inflation, high indebtedness. In my adult lifetime, we'd never balanced our books. We were highly protected, we were uncompetitive, and we thought debt would in fact make up for what we were not earning. And so as a small indebted country that had become uncompetitive, we had a very unattractive future. And, you know, I'll be very honest with you, crisis was the catalyst for change, as too often it is. So having painted the picture, and I hope given you a sense that I'm not doing this from a theoretical point of view, just let me quickly, because you can read uh, my materials on Eleanor's website. Uh, please visit it. it. It's rich with information. What I'd like to do uh, just for now uh, is to effectively just take you through, first of all, the policies and then the politics. So up behind me is the only diagram that I've got. And I call it six of the best. What's the heaven we want? We want a growing economy. Of course you do. You know, I heard somebody say, you know, is, is Greek going to be dead in the process? Well, I'm here to tell you the very reverse. You can have a very lively, growing economy, but what it's going to take is not just, as my friend, the former politician, said, we just choose some particular areas and reform there. No, no, Greece. I'm sorry, I've got to tell you, you've got to reform on every front. Because for every story that we get from the public sector, if I asked you all individually, to stand up and give your own stories, you'd be convincing me I'm not just reforming the public sector, I'm reforming the system of titles, the way to do business, you know, how, how you do or don't pay your taxes. In other words, fundamental reform across the board. So he, here is the critical thing uh, about our reforms. I always use this policy slide. So we had to build the base for the new economy. We had to get inflation under control with independent central bank. Secondly, we had to get our budget under control, which was my job. So I became a minister in my 30s. By the time I left, my country had balanced its books for the first time in my lifetime. And what's more, I wrote fiscal rules, which meant we kept on balancing the budget. Until the global financial crisis hit, New Zealand had a surplus every year. And what's more, public debt reduced from very dangerous levels, such as you see now in Greece, to below 20% of GDP. 
We had to lay the foundations, which is why very well-behaved monetary policy, in your case, that's the European Central Bank's job, but more importantly, fiscal rules that ensure fiscal responsibility were a critical part of laying that foundation. But that's not enough. That's necessary but not sufficient. We then had to turn to open markets in every sense of the word. We had protection that was really high. We wanted to trade with the world in a unilateral way. We abolished all tariffs and all subsidies. So I, I'm a farmer by background. I, I come from farming stock, as many, many do uh, in my country, particularly those who find themselves shouldering positions of public responsibility or holding high public office. Overnight, we eliminated all subsidies to farmers, overnight. Now, you, know, you might say that's cold turkey. If you've got a big problem, you've got to deal with it in a very big way. Our agricultural sector is the most competitive in the world. I go to China to sell infant formula. We are one of the most competitive agricultural traders in the world with not one euro, one dollar of subsidy. We sought free trade agreements with anybody and everywhere we could find them. We were the first country in the world to do a free trade agreement with China, for example. And if you now look at the growing purchasing power of a rising nation like China, despite the political issues that I referred to, they are a huge, huge economic player, and they remember who was the first country in the world to want to do business with them under a free trade agreement. We just unilaterally, we didn't bargain with other countries, you drop your barriers and we'll drop ours. We couldn't afford to do that. It was in our interest to have free trade with all comers. We moved from all the regulation and all the protection. No use coming to see me as a Minister of Finance if you were a business person wanting to export new goods and services. You go into the market. You face the market. You work out what your competitive advantage is and who you're going to trade with. We still have a very healthy manufacturing sector making very high value manufacturers because we work out where the real value add is coming from. We look to the market, not to the government. And on the other side of open and competitive markets, where privilege and protection and shelter and special deals out the window, subsidies with them, on the other side of that, people have to be free to work. If, if you're going to so regulate the work environment, you shouldn't be surprised that the casualty are jobs. There has to be flexibility in that labour market, and particularly here in Europe, where those of you inside the euro, you've effectively given away the capacity for monetary policy to come to the party. And that means everything else has to be more geared to competitiveness. We used to have compulsory unionism, closed shops, all sorts of, of deals uh, for unions that had nothing to do with productivity. There was no relationship between productivity and pay. It was a license to kill jobs. Well, it, I called it a job destruction machine, and it was. We had to pioneer many of these reforms. We couldn't, I'm inviting you to look at our experience, but in many cases where we reformed, there was no experience. So we had to be pioneers. And I can recall the day, six weeks after taking office, as I said, I'm a now person, where we deregulated our labour market. I was told we were going to have horrifically high unemployment. We had high unemployment at the time, it was roughly 15%. Within three years of that measure taking effect, we had the highest rate of job growth in the OECD. And I'm not talking about low paid jobs, I'm talking about jobs where there was the proper link between productivity and pay. And then you go to the top part of, of that diagram, which is the reform of the state. You can't have the bird fly on one wing. You can't say to the private sector, get out there, start trading, 
Greeks, what can you do well? Entrepreneurs who are Greeks elsewhere in the world, come back, do it here. On the one hand, because you've made some reforms in the private sector, and yet you are being strangled by what my friend here has talked about in the public sector. It just doesn't work that way. The reform of the state is every bit as critical as the reform of the private sector. And then, of course, you need to ensure, and this is the, the sixth of, of my uh, diagrams, that to the extent that you believe the state does have a role and needs to be funded, there's only one way, ultimately, that you're going to fund the state, and that's through taxes now, or taxes in the future, which is what borrowing is. And we had horrific tax system. We didn't have the rate of informality that you do. We, we had some, because the top rate of tax was 66%. You know, if you're going to face 66% rate of tax, well, there's a lot of informality in the face of that. Uh, the, the president of France should be listening to this. And so what we did was we said, OK, here's the deal. We're going to constrain the level of public spending. I mean, in my case, we saw once in a generation reduction in the level of public spending. But we're going to finance it by a system where there's a broad base but a low rate. So the deal is all eco economic activity will face a tax but at a low rate. And of course, you have to assure then that you've got integrity, not just in your tax design, but in your tax administration. So those are, the, those are the six things in particular that I wanted to talk about. Uh, just let me run through very quickly, and, and then I can hand to, to Gary, uh, what, what I see as, as some of the crucial policy and uh, political lessons of reform. First of all, you have to make a fundamental decision if you want a modern economy, and that is that markets are going to work. And having faith in markets drove our reform program, hence the openness and the free trade. As a nation, you've got to get, got, got to get the habit of transparency and openness. You've got beautiful sunshine here in Greece. Why not open up all of your systems to that sunshine? You know, corruption breeds in the dark. Corruption breeds when there are privileges and protections. And so openness and accountability are important. I'm arguing for comprehensive, not piecemeal reform. I know the political temptation. We just do a few projects. That won't do a few projects. You waste all your political capital on the few projects, and you don't get uh, the payoff to show for your efforts. All policy had to pass the competitiveness test. So I'm at one with your Nobel laureate. Would it advance competitiveness? Give it a tick. Does this diminish competitiveness? Get rid of it. We understood that incentives matter. Let me define incentives. By incentives, I do not mean the government writing you a check to do something. The only incentive an entrepreneur needs is to know that when he or she wants to start a business or expand or commercialize uh, an innovative idea out of a laboratory or whatever, the only incentive they need is to know that there's a clear path. It's easy to do business, broad-based low rate of tax, they're free to trade, nobody's going to get in their way. That's the incentive that matters, not the incentive that a politician can write with a check. It means you need to rethink the role and the reach of the state. The state in New Zealand used to own most of the economic activity, and badly. Post offices, banks, Land companies, forestry companies, railway companies, you name them, we own them. Take the railways department, which I privatised. It used to employ 25,000 people. So you had an election, the politicians wanted to get re-elected, there was a bit of unemployment in the district. So go to the railways department, just employ those people, thank you very much. Wasn't a proper job at all, but got rid of a political inconvenience. When we came to privatise the railways department, they had 25,000 people working for them. They only needed 5,000. 20,000 had pretend jobs. Not good for them, dreadful for the railways, uh, and bad for the country economically. So looking at, at the, if, if you like, the, um, 
political lessons of all of this. First of all, no area of government should go untouched. I think I'm making that pretty clear. The core state has to move from being a bureaucratic system where there's no link between reward and results. There, needed to be, there needs to be a modern performance management system where people are hired on their merits and are accountable. Our public service used to be a place that people were consigned to if they couldn't find any other job. In the modern public service, where you're genuinely valued for what you do, it, it's an area where people are proud to work. When you do privatisations, you work out what the state should and shouldn't do, there are some really important rules of the road. You don't privatise monopolies. You don't privatise to your mates. You don't privatise at the lowest price. You get the business in good shape, give it a board, give it a balance sheet, make it face competition, and then in that climate, privatise to the best and highest private sector practice. Anything else is a scandal. If you're going to have fiscal responsibility, you need really good fiscal rules. You need budgeting to be open and accountable uh, with proper rules that govern so that you can't say, I'm accounting just for these assets, but not for those liabilities. Greece, among other countries, got found out playing that game. So I said businesses should be free to trade and become accustomed to facing the market and not the government. And finally, where you do have publicly funded services, I think it's crucial, like Sweden, that you give patients and you give pupils and you give the users of those services choices. We live in a world now where the consumer is king, where you, with all the technology, you know, can now cut through everything. You can cut directly to the chase. You know what good government is and what good government is not. It's a world in which there is choice. You're free to exit. You're, you're free to enter. It's a much more dynamic world than the old state ever envisaged. And the state's got to get on that wavelength or it's going to become redundant to citizens. They will lose confidence in it. They will lose confidence in governments that want to maintain that old, unaccountable state. So in the end, what it takes are champions. We have a champion here. I'm sure many of you are willing to be champions in your own right. It takes entrepreneurship to undertake the sort of reform that I'm talking about. Uh, and it takes a team of believers. So in a sense, you've heard of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. I think that this event here in Greece is the beginning of a wonderful new model of reform, which is called crowd reform. Good luck and do it. If only we could see all these things done. If only we could see all these things done.